Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to members and staff in attendance of this meeting of the Standing Committee on Alberta's Economic Future. My name is Nathan Newdorf and I'm the MLA for Lethbridge East and Chair of this committee. I'd ask that members and those joining the committee at the table introduce themselves for the record, starting to my right with the Deputy Chair. Good morning, I'm Nicole Goring, the MLA for Edmonton Castle Downs and welcome to all of our presenters. Garth, <coughs> Garth Rosal, MLA for Million Lane, Mr. Wainwright. Good morning, Jordan Walker, MLA Sherwood Park. Lynn Van Dyken, MLA Athabasca Barhead Westlock. Miranda Rosen, MLA for Banff Kananaskis. Good morning, Drew Barnes, MLA Cypress Medicine Hat. Good morning, Darren Billis, MLA Edmonton Beverly Clairview. Good morning, everyone. Chris Nielsen, MLA for Edmonton Decor. Good morning, Heather Sweet, MLA Edmonton Manning. Good morning, I'm Traffin Koenig with the Parliamentary Council Office. Good morning, Nancy Robert, Clerk of Journals and Committees. Good morning, Aaron Roth, Committee Clerk. I will go online. Uh, Ms. Armstrong Hominuck. Hi, good morning. Uh, MLA for Fort Saskatchewan Vegarville, Jackie Armstrong Hominuck. Thank you. Ms. Fry. Michaela Fry, MLA, Brooks Medicine Hat. Apologies for my terrible connection today, Committee. No problem. Thank you very much. I would like to note for the record the following substitutions Mr. Nielsen for Member Irwin. A few housekeeping items to address before we turn to the business at hand. I would note for members and the guests in the gallery that masks should be worn in the committee room except when you are speaking. And members and guests are also encouraged to leave an appropriate amount of physical distance around the table. Please note that the microphones are operated by the Hansard staff. Committee proceedings are live streamed on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. The audio and video stream and transcripts of meetings can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Those participating by video conference are encouraged to please turn on your camera while speaking and mute your microphone while not speaking. Members participating virtually who wish to be placed on the speakers list are asked to email or send a message in the group chat to the committee clerk and members in the room are asked to please signal the chair. Please set your cell phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. We now to need to move to approval of the agenda. If someone would be willing to move so. Thank you, Ms. Goring. Moved by Ms. Goring that the agenda for the February 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Standing Committee on Alberta's Economic Future be adopted as distributed. All those in favor in the room, please say aye. aye. Any opposed in the room, please say no. Thank you. Online, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone online opposed, please say no. Thank you. That motion is carried. Approval of the minutes from the December 9th, 2021 meeting. We have these minutes from the December 9th, 2021 meeting of the committee. Are there any errors or omissions to note? Seeing not, would a member move that the meetings be accepted? Thank you, Ms. Goring. Moved by Ms. Goring that the meetings of the December 9th, 2021 meeting of the Standing Committee on Alberta's Economic Future be adopted as circulated. All in favor in the room, please say aye. Aye. Anyone in the room opposed, please say no. Thank you. Online, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone, aye. anyone online opposed, please say no. Hearing none, that motion is carried. We will now move to the Lobby Act Review status update. I would like to just take a few moments to uh, refresh the memories of the committee. Uh, honorable members, before we proceed with the hearing oral presents, presentations today, I would like to provide the committee with a recap of where we are at in our review of the Lobbyist Act. The committee has heard technical briefings from both the Ethics Commissioner and the Lobbyist Registrar and from the Ministry of Justice and the Solicitor General. The, the committee has requested research from the Legislative Assembly Office Research Services which we'll hear more about later today, particularly in their jurisdictional scan results. The committee has also invited written submissions from stakeholders and the public. Most of these written submissions have been posted to the committee's internal website. At this stage of the re review, we are about to start hearing oral presentations and receive a briefing on the research completed by research services. A few further notes that I'd like to provide is that uh, with the written submissions online, other than those that did not pertain to the topic or contained uh, inappropriate language or content, uh, they're all there. You can access through the committee portal. We had invited at our last meeting uh, eight oral presentations. Two have declined, so we will be hearing six. I believe there's three today and three on March the 2nd, which is our next meeting. I do apologize for that landing on the constituency break. Uh, we planned that before I had that calendar fully, but 
uh, in the future, I'll hope to avoid constituency breaks as best as we're able to. Uh, for this committee, we have to complete this review and submit our recommendations as to be completed by March 13th of this year, or sorry, September 13th of this year. I apologize. We've got a lot more time than I, uh, so we have a lot of time for that. And this, this act, this lobbyist act is reviewed every five years. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can have a chat later today. During this meeting, we will, with unanimous consent, go to an in-camera session where we can have some uh, conversation about how we'd like to proceed through the rest of this session and up until we have to complete our review by September 13th. Sorry, September 13th, yeah. Uh, we, I will also hopefully allow for a, a short break approximately at 1030 likely between some presentations so that any members needing a break uh, are able to do so. Are there any questions or comments at this stage in our review? Okay. Seeing none, I will acknowledge that uh, Ms. Ahir has joined us online. Uh, Ms. Ahir, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sorry, mute problems. Good morning, everyone. Leela here, Chestermere Strathmore. Thank you very much. So with no further questions, I appreciate that, that review. There will be opportunity to discuss that a little bit further on in the meeting. Um, at any time, please signal the chair if you have some questions or would like clarity provided by the clerk or anyone else. We'll now move to oral presentations in relation to the Lobbies Act review. <coughs> Honourable members, our first presentation today will be from the Honourable Marguerite Trussler, Ethics Commissioner, and Ms. Laura Draper, General Counsel and Lobbyist Registrar. Ms. Trussler and Ms. Draper, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table and the microphones, you have 15 minutes to make your presentation, and once you're settled, we will start the clock and hand the floor over to you. the committee, Ms. Draper is online, so I will invite her to share her camera and unmute herself at the appropriate time. Ms. Tressler. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting us to present today. I will deal very briefly with several of our recommendations and then Ms. Draper, who is attending virtually, will cover the remaining ones. It will be easier uh, for you to follow our presentation because we're skipping around quite quickly if you have our submission in front of you. So I just want to start with a brief introduction. The theme of our presentation is that it is time for a change. Change is in the wind in all jurisdictions across Canada. One recent example is British Columbia, which has implemented extensive reforms to its lobbyist legislation. And the reason we need to make substantial change is transparency. The citizens of this province deserve full disclosure and transparency. If you read the submissions from individuals, you'll have seen how lobbyists, many of whom are reliable, honest professionals, are viewed by the general public. The reason for this is that people do not know what they do and proper transparency is not in place in Alberta. So first of all, I'd like to turn to recommendation one, which is the communications registry. This recommendation is our most important recommendation and all the others flow from it. Because the best way to have deserved transparency is to have a communications registry. Both Ottawa and British Columbia have them, and other provinces are moving in that direction. I know it's top on the WIST list of almost other, every other lobbyist registrar in Canada. Having a lobbyist registry by itself does not indicate the lobbyist's true lobbying activity. It's only by having a record of meetings and communications that you have true transparency. Not having one, gives rise to people asking, what do you have to hide? Now, implementing a registry is a simple process with no budgetary implication 
and no responsibility for busy MLAs. It also will not in any way affect your day-to-day -day transactions with your constituents. And as I've already stated, this recommendation is our priority recommendation and many of our recommendations simplifying and making matters less complex for lobbyists will not work without this recommendation's adoption. So now I'd like to jump to recommendation number four on gifts and then say a few things about recommendation five. The provisions of 6.2 are too complex. They require lobbyists to know the gift provisions in all the various codes of conduct of the ABCs, of which there are over 100, as well as the Conflicts of Interest Act, the Public Service Act, and the Political Staff Code of Conduct. There should be one amount for allowable gifts set out clearly in the Lobbyist Act, like BC does. We would suggest $200. There are also loopholes in this section that we have explained that need fixing. And with respect to recommendation five, given the time limitations, I'm not going to spend any time on this recommendation as it is self-explanatory. It is a further loophole that can be and is exploited, and we very much doubt that it was intended. So now I want to move on to recommendation six, there's a discrepancy between the initial time for filing requirements for organizational lobbyists and consultant lobbyists. And the time limit for organizational lobbyists is ludicrously long, and it does create transparency issues because of things that might happen during that time period. And it could be easily shortened without burdening the organizational lobbyists. Now, finally, uh, trying to bear in mind time, I'm going to just make a few comments about Section B and Section C. So Section B of our brief has 12 recommendations. This section, meaning Section B, is our red tape reduction section. Registration itself is not red tape and it's necessary, but there are parts of the Act that are onerous without furthering the intent of the Act. These recommendations in Section B involving process will clarify and simplify matters for us and for lobbyists. Many of them have been requested by lobbyists. We've heard their complaints over the years. And three examples are Section 3, 4, and 5. Again, because of time restraints, I'm not going to go through them in any detail. And with respect to Section C, all of the recommendations in Section C are technical in nature. And we would ask that you refer all of them to justice for consideration. And we expect, in fact, we know that justice has a few of its own that they'd also like uh, to discuss and to implement. So thank you for your time. And Ms. Draper is now going to touch on the remaining recommendations. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, good morning, everyone. So a critical amendment that would address a significant gap in public transparency and accountability would be to replace the current broad exemption for nonprofit organizations with one that is more targeted. And this is amendment uh, number A7 in our written submission. Now, committee members may have noted that some of the written submissions in this review that support maintaining the current nonprofit exemption refer to it as an exemption for public benefit nonprofits. However, that description does not reflect how wide reaching the exemption actually is. Basically, other than the in house personnel of nonprofits like unions and professional associations or business or industry organizations, the in house personnel of all other nonprofit organizations currently are exempt from the Lobbyist Act. So this is a very broad exemption that ends up not only exempting nonprofits that the public commonly would consider to be public benefit in nature, like charities or others that focus on providing support services to the community, it also ends up allowing many other nonprofits to avoid public transparency and accountability about their lobbying altogether. And this can include organizations that have a mandate to carry out a significant amount of lobbying, that have a lot of policy influence, that receive a lot of public funding from government, 
or that receive funding from other individuals and organizations to back their advocacy efforts behind the scenes. So for example, think of special interest organizations that have a mandate of influencing policy on particular social, economic, and political issues in the interests of their members and supporters, and think tanks or policy institutes on all sides of the political spectrum that have a primary purpose of performing research and advocacy on various social, economic, and political matters. And remember that whether an individual agrees or disagrees with the policy stances of these various nonprofits does not matter. Those organizations can continue to lobby about their chosen policy goals. It is simply time that the public, and that includes registered lobbyists who feel that those exempt organizations lobbying efforts conflict with their own, finally have transparency about those lobbying efforts. So we recommend that the current nonprofit exemption be replaced with a more targeted one that still exempts nonprofits that most commonly would be considered to be public benefit in nature, like most charities and other community service organizations, without letting so many other nonprofits hide behind it as well. And specifically, we have proposed an alternative exemption for nonprofits that are established for the purpose of providing tangible community support services directly to the public in subject matter areas like education, animals, arts, children, community sports or recreation, culture, disability, health, uh, relief of poverty, seniors or social or financial assistance. And the committee also should note that most Canadian jurisdictions do not have any specific uh, exemption for nonprofit organizations. And that includes Ontario, uh, British Columbia, Canada at the federal level the Yukon, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and the city of Ottawa. And in Saskatchewan, a nonprofit organization only is exempt if it has a charitable purpose and less than five employees, and the organization's collective lobbying time is less than 30 hours annually. So we urge the committee to take action now to catch up with most of the rest of Canada by addressing the serious gap in public transparency and accountability resulting from the current uh, overly broad exemption for nonprofits. Uh, Alberta shouldn't wait another five years to remedy this issue. Uh, now, another important amendment to improve public transparency and accountability about in-house lobbying would be to reduce the organization lobbyist threshold from 50 hours annually including both the time spent lobbying and preparing to lobby to 20 hours annually. And that again includes both the time spent lobbying and preparing to lobby. And this is amendment number A3 in our written submission. So the current 50 hour threshold allows a substantial amount of influence on and access to public office holders by in-house lobbyists to avoid public transparency and accountability altogether. And this is because a significant level of influence and access can be achieved in much less than 50 hours of lobbying communication and prep time. Plus, as we discussed in our submission and in our previous presentation, there is a loophole in the act whereby an organization can outsource preparation time to avoid meeting the time threshold that triggers registration. So Alberta needs to be forward thinking about providing much needed public transparency and accountability about lobbying activities by establishing a threshold for registration of organization lobbyists that doesn't allow so much in-house lobbying to fly under the radar. And for example, uh, the committee should take note of other Canadian jurisdictions with recently amended or enacted legislation that have thresholds that make it harder for organization lobbyists to avoid registration. So in British Columbia, the threshold is 50 hours. However, the organization also must have less than six employees and must not have a primary purpose of promoting or opposing issues or representing the interests of their members. Otherwise, the organization would still need to register even if it does not meet 50 hours of time. Uh, in Saskatchewan, the threshold is 30 hours, including communication time, preparation time, and travel time as well, which we do not include. And in the Yukon, the threshold is 20 hours. 
Uh, and finally, I'm mindful of the clock ticking here, uh, together with the establishment of communications, uh, the communications registry noted by Commissioner Trussler earlier in the presentation, we also recommend that re the requirement for organization lobbyists to file semi-annual renewal returns be removed from the act. And for reference, this is amendment number A2 in our written submission. So the act already requires organization lobbyists to keep their active registrations up to date within a 30 day period by filing a notice of change. And as a result, the requirement to also file a semi-annual renewal return every six months is an unnecessary administrative burden for many organization lobbyists as many of them already regularly update their active registrations by filing notices of change in between their semi-annual renewal return deadlines. And it also creates confusion among other organization lobbyists that discourages them from promptly updating their registrations, as many of them mistakenly think that the only time that they do need to update their active registration is when their semi-annual renewal return is due. And as an example in practice of our recommended approach, British Columbia has the same ongoing filing requirements for both consultant and organization lobbyists, which consist of a requirement to file a report as needed each month for any lobbying communication with a senior public office holder that happened within the previous month. So that would be the communications registry that Commissioner Trussler uh, referenced earlier and a requirement to update the organization's registration as needed each month to reflect any changes to the content that arose since the previous month. And Canada at the federal level also takes uh, a similar approach to that. Uh, however, just before we wrap up, for this recommendation to work in practice, the Alberta legislation also must provide the lobbyist registrar with a broad power to audit lobbyist compliance with their ongoing obligation to file a notice of change in order to incentivize and enforce them to keep their registrations consistently updated absent a regularly scheduled renewal requirement. And this is because although many lobbyists are professional and proactive about complying with their obligation to file a notice of change, there inevitably will be lobbyists who are not. So there must be a clear means for this office to promote and enforce compliance with the ongoing filing obligations in order for the removal of the semi-annual renewal return requirement to actually work. Uh, I think that's it for our presentation time, but we would welcome any questions at this point. Thank you both Ms. Tressler and Ms. Draper for your presentation. I have tentatively set the question time for about 15 minutes, but there is some flexibility with that uh, at this time. Please uh, either signal the clerk or myself and we'll start the questions. Mr. Roswell. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, uh, I'm just wondering about A1 and A2. So if A1 didn't get approved, uh, or adopted, I guess, is the right word. I, I was just looking at A2, and, and um, I'm just thinking from a red tape opportunity, is it necessary to have a semi-annual if you're doing notice of a change every 30 days? Like, I'm just wondering about the logic of having that semi-annual component in there. Semi-annual is quite a burden, and we thought that it would be much less of a burden because a lot of people register and don't do a lot of lobby. Um, we thought that the communications registry would be less of a burden uh, than the semi-annual return. And because they're already required to update it, we thought this was a pretty fair exchange, but it would provide so much more transparency. So even if A1 wasn't adopted? Is well, no, because then that starts to cause problems. Does it? Okay. All right. Okay. Mr. Walker? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here uh, and for all the great work you and your staff do. This has been very informative thus far. Uh, my question will focus similar uh, to MLA Roswell and with a focus on red tape. As you know, our government's been very focused on reducing red tape and has achieved great success. So I guess, Commissioner, through the Chair, um, in drafting your recommendations, how did you balance the need uh, to reduce red tape uh, and the complexity with increasing transparency 
Um, because to the less familiar eye, uh, the layperson perhaps, including myself as the humble representative for Sherwood Park, uh, it would appear you are recommending more filing requirements and reducing red tape at the same time. So I just wonder how you would approach that question. Thank you. Well, as I said, I think it's a trade-off between one and two, and uh, that uh, most lobbyists would uh, would find that they have a little bit less work to do than doing the semi-annual. I know they find the semi-annual fairly burdensome, but that's why we put in Section B of, of our uh, uh, report, uh, because there are many things that the lobbyists have brought to our attention. For example, uh, Three, B3, we now have to have uh, as a designated filer the most senior officer of the company. That senior officer might be in Dallas or might be in London or Antwerp or wherever, and they know very little about what's going on in Alberta. And it's, it's a big burden for them to, to be the, the designated filer. Uh, the other one that's a problem is they have to... Uh, they have to disclose all government funding that they get anywhere in the world. And that's a big burden on them too, so that's why we suggested that it be cut back to uh, just Alberta. And then uh, the, the final thing, or at least example that they've asked for, is when you've got a parent corporation and a subsidiary, you should be able to file just one for both of them, because usually the same organizational lobbyists look after it. So those are the sorts of things we looked to, we looked at, in terms of making things easier for them and making things easier for us. There's some of these things will make things easier for us, or clarifying things so that they don't have to worry or or phone us and take some time to figure out what the section really means. So we have looked very carefully at at reducing the burden. But the communications registry is the answer. That's the transparency. And so we've tried to take away a lot of other issues so that we can have that. And we don't think we should have a communications registry like they have in Ottawa, which is very, very onerous. Like you have to file every month. What we're suggesting is only, whether you've lobbied or not, we're suggesting that you only have to file when you have a communication. So it, we, we don't think that we need to go as far. Uh, we have limited the number of people uh, that you would, uh, that this applies to in terms of senior public office holders. Ottawa is much more broad. So we've, we've looked at what would work for Alberta, give the, give the transparency that the public should have, but not create uh, too big a burden on the lobbyists. So it's been a balancing act. We've talked about a lot in the office. How is the best way to do this? And this is what we've come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sweet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner uh, Tressler, for your presentation. Um, and, of course, Ms. Dra Draper as well. Um, I'd like to focus on number seven, narrowing the exemption of in-house personnel of nonprofit organizations. Um, so... If can we elaborate, or, or could I get some more information just in regards to how we would see um, this recommendation being put into practice? So, would we would it be something along the lines of looking at? Um, I guess what would the definition of your think tank be? What would your what would would it be any individual? I guess who is looking at? How would you define between a private citizen? I guess and then an organization first. Let's start there, and then I'll process it. Pass that. I, I'm not. Sh I'm going to let Ms. Draper answer this question, but I'm not sure you un I understand. If it's just a private citizen talking to an MLA, that's not lobbying. You've so got to be paid before you're a lobbyist. And so are you asking us who would we include and who we did exclude? So I guess I'm looking at, as we see movements across the country developing, and there may be financial pieces attached to that, um, would there, how would we determine individuals who are engaging in lobbying of governments, meeting with government officials, meeting with government MLAs, um, who may or may not be getting financial assistance through new organizations as they're being developed, that may not be typically considered under the Lobbyist Act? Well, 
Well, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, I'm having some trouble hearing you, but I'm also oh, not sorry. quite sure that I understand the question. Because that one's for narrowing the exemption for in-house personnel. So when I look at the definition of like a think tank, yes. now, we, we now want that consideration to be put in place under the yes, changes. Yes, th we, we would want to include all the think tanks as having to register. And then what outside of that? So, I mean, I think it could be a broad, there could be many organizations that could fall under the definition of a think tank, depending on what they're coming and what topic yeah. they're discussing. So how would we create those definitions and ensure that individuals are being registered when they need to be registered? Well, I think if you're just a think tank, you would not have an exemption. What we're looking at exempting are the true charities the groups that provide services to the public. M Mr. Aber, maybe you'd like to add something. Yeah, I'm, I have to be honest, I'm not totally clear exactly on the question either, but I, just picking up on Member Sweet's last uh, comment about how we distinguish based on the nature of the communication uh, with the government, if it's a think tank or not, it would be to determine if something's a think tank or the, the nature of the organization, we'd be looking at it um, like the nature of the organization itself, what it was established to do, maybe we look at their bylaws or um, other constating documents. It wouldn't be about the nature of the communication because it would all be, the nature of the communication we're concerned about is lobbying, which is defined in the act. Um, so to determine whether something would fall within the exemption or not, we're gonna be looking at uh, the nature of the organization and that includes in our exemption we used, uh, or our proposed exemption, uh, looking at the, um, what they're established to do and how much of their budget they're spending on actually providing service, tangible support services directly to the government in certain subject matter areas. So that would be the focus of determining whether someone or a organization is exempt or not. It wouldn't necessarily be focused on the nature of their communication. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> you have a further supplement? No, okay, thank you. No? Uh, Ms. Rosen. Okay, thank you. I have a question about recommendation A3, uh, which would be to reduce the threshold from 50 to 20 hours, uh, which includes, I believe, time preparing to lobby as well as lobbying. Uh, there's been a number of small organizations who have asked for the previous change down from 100 to 50 to be reversed back up to 100 uh, rather than decreased further. Um, and they, they noted that they already have limited resources and it is a burden on them if this were to go forward and decrease that allowance even further. So I'm wondering if you have any recommendations of how we could potentially uh, create an allowance for smaller organizations, or if not, um, if you are confident that the benefit of lowering that threshold would outweigh the concerns from the smaller organizations who are already worried that the allowance is too strict for them. Well, I have to say to you that 50 hours of lobbying is a lot. I actually did a little bit of lobbying when I was practicing law in the 70s and 80s. And quite frankly, if it takes you 50 hours to get your message across, <laughs> you're not very good. So 50 hours is, is really a lot of time. And all the other jurisdictions are moving to delete that threshold because a really good lobbyist uh, can do a lot of lob effective lobbying in way less time than even 20 hours. Uh, so. Uh, it, you know, it's not that big a burden, particularly if we just if we just have the communications registry and they don't have to register every six months. But these organizations, uh, many organizations, they have to file with CRA every year. They have to file with corporate registry every year. And I can tell you, having done both of those <laughs> and having uh, been the guinea pig when we put in place the new registry, that fi filling out the forms for our registry are way less onerous than any of those others. I dislike forms intensely, and so that's why I went through and did the form first when we put the new registry in place, and I actually got through it without, um, without any grumbling. Mm -hmm. May I add to that, please? Please do. Yes, okay. Please do. Um, so 
so a threshold based on hours spent lobbying, although it's not perfect, is an objective measure measure of determining the registration requirement that at least is directly lobby uh, related to the lobbying itself. Um, on the other hand, if we introduce an element of the number of employees into the threshold, I think there should be consideration as to whether that measure is even less directly linked to the lobbying activities and to the level of influence and access. So for example, if we think of an organization maybe has only two employees, but they're very well connected, they lobby a lot, uh, they have a lot of policy influence, but if we introduce a small organization element or number of employees element into the threshold, they wouldn't have to register. So just, I would consider that that kind of element gets a little bit further removed from the lobbying relationship or the effect of the lobbying activities. Thank you. Do you have a further supplemental, Ms. Rosen? <clears throat> uh, no, I think I'm okay for now. Thank you. Any other members wishing to ask questions at this time? I am. Um uh, Chair, this is Emily Armstrong Hominier. Yeah, we will put you on the list. Uh, we will go to the opposition, Mr. Billis, first. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question around, um, I'm just looking at it, I think it's 6.2 is your recommendation. So it's just talking about how it's pretty complex. Um, I believe this is about benefits, prohibited gifts, provision. Well, that might change my question. Sorry, I was just looking at this as, uh, I appreciate the fact that you're trying to simplify it. It's a two-step process that's fairly com complex depending on who the lobbyist is, is trying to lobby or meet with or communicate with. Um, so I appreciate that end of it. Uh, my question is just around, so BC has a limit of 100 total annual. Um, and so appreciate that you folks uh, believe that that's a little too restrictive. And so you're proposing a 200 cumulative annual limit um, in Alberta. Can you give some examples of, of that? Um, and I'm just, I guess I can, I can move quickly through this in that I'm just thinking of um, any type of, of live events um, that, uh, that may be um, offered or used as, as the opportunity for the lobbyists to engage with whomever. And so um, that would obviously be applied through this 200. No, it, it may, 200 is just a suggestion, particularly for tangible gifts, because that's one in the Conflicts of Interest Act already. You might want to, and this is all open for debate, put 400 in for an invitation. The general public doesn't look too fondly on you getting these invitations for $400. But uh, you do have to get out in the community some events, and sometimes uh, a lobbyist will take you to an event where you should be seen. So I can understand that. But uh, I would certainly not go above 400. Uh, I personally believe that the 100 is too restrictive. So uh, gifts themselves should not be above 200. Uh, but it would really be up to you to decide what that range should be. I know one of the problems, and it's raised in some of the, some of the submissions, is our conferences, where you get invited to conferences and people want to schmooze with you. Well, I can tell you from my experience as chair of AGLC, I got invited to a lot of conferences. And there was a lot of schmoozing, and we had a, we had a registration paid and everything to do with it paid. And after I went there for one year and saw, I saw a lot of cabinet ministers there too, uh, and went there, I, I felt uncomfortable. I felt that it was too big a gift, too big an opportunity, even though it was just sort of for us to go and give an update for a session for an hour. That, so afterwards, we actually paid our, our own uh, hotel uh, to the event. So I have seen what these conferences are like and in most cases unless you're a keynote speaker there's got to be some limits on them because I found them very uncomfortable. So that's why I wouldn't go above the 400. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Do you have a further supplemental, Mr. Bill? 
Thank you. Uh, we will go to uh, Ms. Armstrong Hominick uh, for the last question as we've hit that time threshold, unless there's a burning desire for further questions. Go ahead. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, Alberta's current 50 hour threshold is already consistent with lower than hour based thresholds in other Canadian provincial jurisdictions, notably Ontario, BC and Manitoba. Why do you feel the need to lower this threshold if it's currently on par with several other provinces? I'll ask Ms. Draper to respond to that question. Uh, so just first one uh, correction, it's actually BC's is not lower, or sorry, ours is not lower than BC's. They do currently have a 50 hour threshold. However, it's not just a straight time threshold, as I mentioned earlier, it's 50 hours, but the organization also has to have less than six employees and cannot have a primary purpose of promoting or opposing issues or representing the interests of their members. Otherwise, if they have more than six employees or if they have a primary purpose that falls within that uh, category, they have to register even if they don't meet 50 hours, even if it's five hours. So it's actually not uh, more, it's not harder to meet that threshold than it is uh, to meet ours currently. Um, and then as we kind of mentioned in the presentation there, if you look at examples of recently an amended or enacted legislation in other jurisdictions, so jurisdictions that have updated their legislation more recently or have enacted more recently in the past few years, it is a trend of lowering that threshold. So in Saskatchewan, it's now 30 hours, which includes communication time, uh, prep time, as well as travel time. And we don't include travel time uh, currently. And in Yukon, the threshold is actually 20 hours. So, you know, we would submit that the trend is to move before thinking and move towards more transparency and accountability in Canada for lobbying, uh, in-house lobbying. So if you want to compare it to older standards, that's one thing, but if you're looking forward thinking, it's a trend towards lowering it to provide that much needed transparency and accountability. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, at this time, I do not see a, an overall uh, emphasis on further questions, and we have uh, taken that roughly 15 to 20 minute time period. So I would like to thank Ms. Trussler and Ms. Draper for your presentation, for your willingness to answer questions and your time today. And I'm sure that if there's any further clarifications needed, this committee will reach out to you for those. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. At this time, we will move to the volunteer and philanthropic organizations. I would like now to welcome Ms. Karen Ball, Executive Director, and Ms. Alexa Briggs, Director of Policy and Research from the Calgary Chamber of Volunteer Organizations, as well as Ms. Gemma Dunn, uh, Executive Director, Edmonton Chamber of Volunteer Organizations, to make their presentation. Uh, I'm not sure who will begin, but you have 15 minutes uh, for your presentation, followed by approximately 15 minutes of questions. Please begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Newdorf. Um, I would also suggest uh, we could offer to take all questions after Mr. Wyatt's presentation, if the chair should so wish. Thank you. We'll um, make that determination at that time. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today as part of this mandatory review of the Lobbyist Act. Um, I'm Karen Ball, the President and CEO of the Calgary Chamber of Voluntary Organizations, CCVO, a registered charity whose mandate is to provide leadership on policy issues that affect the sector as a whole. I'm joined today by my colleague, Gemma Dunn, Executive Director of the Edmonton Chamber of Voluntary Organizations. In speaking to this legislation, we remain responsible to the 26,000 Alberta nonprofits whose voices we represent. Our combined research and extensive engagement with organizations in the charitable and voluntary sector gives us a deep understanding of the contributions made and challenges faced by these nonprofits across Alberta. Under the Lobbyist Act, an organization is considered to be nonprofit if it is organized and operated exclusively for any other purpose except profit. This test is appropriate for the exemption as there is a fundamental and identifiable difference between acting for personal gain and acting for public benefit. Ms. Draper referred to public benefit and other types of nonprofits. The opposite of public benefit is private benefit or private gain 
and no nonprofits exist within this structure. When nonprofit organizations speak to government, it is through the voice of individuals, families, and communities that they serve for the benefit of the public, which is at the core of what it means to be nonprofit. What the Lobbyist Act addresses that most concerns Albertans is the potential for individuals to receive private benefit as a result of influencing government officials. Although nonprofits may attempt to influence government for benefit, there is a fundamental difference between lobbying government for a policy change that is aimed at a public benefit, such as reducing teen suicide rates, and lobbying for a commercial interest that delivers profits as a private benefit. If we accept the principle underpinning this distinction, then it is not necessary to remove the exemption for public benefit nonprofits. It serves as a simple, effective, and indeed elegant policy solution. We remain committed to this position as we were in previous reviews of this legislation in 2007, 2012, and 2016. Removing or altering the exemption will see significant impact in three main ways. One, Increase red tape for government and this being red tape awareness week. We really feel that this is an important thing to talk about today Two, increased administrative burden red tape for nonprofits and three a fundamental altering of the relationship between government and nonprofits that will not allow the government of Alberta and its leadership to fully benefit from the valuable and considered input of nonprofits when serving Albertans. This government has made a strong commitment to removing red tape across all ministries. Removing the exemption would increase the government's red tape count in the tens of thousands. Altering the exemption would also create thousands of red tapes as organizations and their volunteers attempt to understand what rules apply to them, how to interpret and apply the act, and how to alter their practices and procedures as a result. CCVO has worked for years to promote understanding of the rules for registered charities and nonprofits. Complex rules, such as those imposed by the CRA for charities. And we know firsthand how challenging this is and how cautious organizations are about proceeding within the rules so as not to harm their federal registration or provincial registration statuses. Judging by the vast number of FAQs on the Office of the Ethics Commissioner's website related to lobbying, we can see it's currently difficult for many organizations to understand the Act and how it applies. This is for private companies that have paid staff dedicated to support lobbyist administration. Aside from the complexities of the Act itself, the changes proposed by the Ethics Commissioner for Nonprofits are difficult to understand in practical application, even for me and will cause no small amount of confusion across the sector. Confusion that will be aimed at the Office of the Ethics Commissioner, thereby significantly increasing red tape burden on government. Past reviews of this legislation tell us that proposed change will result in a strong public response from many organizations and volunteers all across Alberta, a response directed at ministers, MLAs, and ministries. Adding red tape across government and taking time and resources that could be better spent addressing community needs, particularly at this critical time. Along with the potential for the creation of red tape for government, changes to the legislation will increase administrative burden on nonprofits who will utilize their resources towards delivering crucial services to Albertans every single day. Given the strong public sentiment that organizations should focus as much as possible on serving their mission, even if their mission is to provide policy advice to government, Changes that layer more non-essential work on nonprofit organizations must be taken seriously, particularly at this time when these organizations are stretched thin owing to additional burdens of decreased funding and increased service demand during the pandemic. Many organizations remain under-resourced and have had to cancel essential programs and services that support Albertans in their time of need. They simply lack the capacity to take on the rise in community need much less greater administrative burden related to tracking and reporting. I will pass it to my colleague Gemma Dunn to address our final issue more fully. Gemma. Sorry. Thank you, Karen. Like CCVO, ECVO, the Edmonton Chamber of Voluntary Organizations, is a registered charity with a mandate to give voice to issues that impact the nonprofit sector. 
If we fundamentally alter the relationship between government and non-profits, this will prevent the government from fully benefiting from the valuable and considerable inputs of non-profits to address issues of joint concern. Non-profits have a long history of supporting local, provincial and federal governments to make sound policy decisions. If the exemption were to be removed, this would diminish communication between government officials and non-profit organisational leaders, when in reality what is needed is, is an environment that stimulates engagement, dialogue and collaboration between the non-profit and public sectors. As Karen has said, introducing legislation that defines a certain interactions to be lobbying and others as not lobbying will create confusion and uncertainty as organisations struggle to discern which side of the line they are on. This will undoubtedly create a chilling effect, one in which non-profit boards and staff will begin to err on the side of caution and limit their engagement with government officials entirely as to risk not going offside. What marks the line between lobbying and advocacy? Of the tens of thousands of active non-profits in Alberta, you will find that a considerable portion, if not the majority, consider advocacy to be essential to their missions. Governments at all levels have benefited from sector advocacy, from the sector's eagerness to maintain strong communication with institutions and policy makers, all of whom are collectively working to better our society. Currently, the relationship that exists between non-profit organisations and the government of Alberta is one of joint benefit. Sector leaders working to advance their missions for public benefit ensure that their work is founded on solid evidence, research and data. They share this research and data with the government to support and advance essential work in our communities. There is a wealth of data collected during the um, pandemic. This data was shared freely with government administration and was utilised within a number of ministries to make timely programme and policy decisions that improved the lives of many Albertans who were suffering from job losses, mental health challenges and extreme uncertainty about the future. Currently, sector leaders are asked by administration for their insights. The loss of the current exemption would cost the government dearly. As my colleague shared earlier, it would create additional red tape and the loss of essential intelligence, community-based research and data and insight into the issues affecting Albertans. The COVID-19 pandemic has only highlighted the need for stronger and clearer lines of communication between government and the non-profit sector. Over the past two years, the government of Alberta and the province's non-profits have worked together like never before, under the most severe pressure to support Albertans struggling from the effects of the pandemic. By changing the nature of the lobbyist act, these lines would diminish once again. Again, we urge you to consider the impacts of such a change, not only to the non-profit sector, but also on the government of Alberta itself, which would surely suffer from less engagement, dialogue and collaboration with the sector. Once you change the nature of the relationship between the sector leaders and government leaders, it is irrevocably changed. Building back this trust and willingness to engage would take years. Albertans simply cannot afford such a loss. Removing the exemption could well create a situation that is confusing, confusing, burdensome and alters the working relationship with government. It could contribute towards an advocacy chill, wherein boards of directors concerned about violating the rules will choose not to support advocacy efforts. This will deprive public policymakers of the expertise and the ground level perspective that resides with non-profits and charities. Removing this exemption for public benefit non-profits is a solution to a problem that does not exist. We are unaware of any evidence to suggest Albertans believe a problem exists. In the absence of a strong rationale for lifting the exemption, we urge the government of Alberta not to make changes to the Lobbyist Act that would create both unnecessary red tape for the government of Alberta and unnecessary work for the Alberta non-profits working in public interest and for public benefit. Maintaining the exemption for non-profits would come with a benefit for the ability, the ability for the organisations we serve to continue to put their time in advancing their mandates and missions and solving so social problems, building a better society. And the benefits that come from this work are for all Albertans and for public interest. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. After a brief consultation with the vice chair, I think because of the, the, the nature of your uh, presentation, we would like to offer you a full 15 to 20 minutes of questions directly to you. Uh, and then Mr. Wyatt, we would do separate you're welcome to stay online and he could defer questions to you potentially if that was his desire. 
Um, but that way we would be able to specifically address questions raised in your presentation without um, maybe causing confusion for the committee. At this time, I will begin taking the list for questions, and I will begin to my right with the Vice Chair, Ms. Goring. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really want to express my deepest appreciation for the work that you do supporting Albertans, uh, especially considering what's been going on with COVID. Uh, your advocacy and support for Albertan families is so much appreciated. Um, and thank you for your presentation. <laughs> when you guys submitted your written presentation, there were so many signatories that were included in that. And I'm hoping that you can speak to the level of agreement and support on your positions within the nonprofit sector um, and kind of highlight some of the discussions that you've been having with your members about this issue. Thank you. Um, so we have had um, many discussions around the Alberta Nonprofit Network table. Um, so that is a group of leaders who come together and we have, we're a network of networks where we have um, a number of um, nonprofit organizations who are signed up as um, subscribers to that network. We have a government relations committee that Karen and I co-chair, and this issue comes up over and over again around how the nonprofit sector engages with um, the government of Alberta on issues of public interest. What I can say from my conversations is that many of my, of me, many of the members of ECVO and um, indeed Albert, the Alberta Nonprofit Network are fully in support of the exemption remaining in its current state. The, the work that it would take for these nonprofit organizations to have this additional administrative burden to register when they're already not seeing administrative rises in any kind of grants or fundraising. In fact, they're, they're seeing a tightening of resources would create a complete strain on, on their administrative uh, administratively. I'll turn over to Karen because she can talk about what, from CCBO's perspective, what they have been um, speaking to. Thank you, Gemma, through the chair, and thank you, MLA Goring, for the question. Um, I agree with Gemma. One of, of the fundamental things that we're seeing at this point of time is that many public benefit organizations are actually having to pull back on essential programs and services offered to Albertans and their families. So we do not think this would be, we do not think it's appropriate to make the distinction um, and the exemption between public benefit and private benefit organizations. Uh, removed from the act, but we also uh, really recognize that at this time, what we're hearing from our members and from the 26,000 Alberta nonprofits that serve our communities is that there just is no additional time for anything else. In fact, those essential services are not being delivered at the, because of the lack of um, capacity within these organizations. So it is a very real and prescient concern, and we are hearing it from both larger institutional organizations like the YMCA network that signed the letter, as well as smaller organizations like ourselves. We are only six employees and we, we would be considered a small organization um, that uh, potentially is being recommended to lose exemption under the Act. And it would be a huge stress at this time for both small and large organizations. Thank you. Do you have a supplemental? I do. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you talking about the level of increased bureaucracy and specifically the red tape that this would create. I think that that speaks uh, volumes to, to the concerns. Um, you had mentioned in your presentation the previous reviews of this legislation, and I'm curious um, if you've heard concerns from the public since the last time the legislation was reviewed about the exemption, and has the issue of lobbying in nonprofit sector been brought forward often? Thank you, through the chair. Um, we did, uh, we hear mostly from those working within the nonprofit sector in our particular role and from our perspective. Um, and we did, of course, send a, um, a, a survey for response that informed our uh, submission 
to you today and did have a strong response from nonprofits as we did in previous um, iterations of coming for before this committee or for review. Um, we've had hundreds of organizations speak to this issue to us over the past years that we have been working on the the lobbyist registration and review. Um, we we do not hear from the public at large that there is a trust issue with nonprofits and how nonprofits work with government. Um, that's never been anything that has come up to me and in, in from my perspective around um, trust of nonprofits. Nonprofits deal in trust. They do it for a variety of reasons. They do it because this is how they um, raise income and funds from donors and sponsors. They need to be in a position of trust. They're responsible to their members, the general public, and they're guided by volunteer boards of directors. All of that relies upon public trust and truly reflecting the needs of the people that they serve according to their mandate. And so we do not see that trust eroding in any particular way on nonprofits at this time across the province. I would agree with my colleague. Um, the only thing that I would add it further to Karen's comments are the fact that the, the community is expecting the nonprofit sector to step up. They're expecting the community to engage with government officials. They're expecting a level of communication to happen at that level to ensure that the needs of our communities are being met. And so, as I as I mentioned in my presentation this um, exemption, the removal of this exemption is responding to a problem that does not exist. Thank you very much. Uh, do I see another question? Mr. Van Dyken. Hey, thank you, Chair. And um, thank you uh, both for your presentation this morning, uh, but not only for the work you're doing this morning, but for the work that your uh, association and members are doing to uh, to improve civil society as we know it. Uh, it's very much appreciated and very much uh, recognized as an important part of, uh, of society's well-being, the work that you're, you're, you're accomplishing. Um, but I, I, I'm looking at uh, recommendation seven from the uh, ethics commissioner and the lobbyist registrar, and I'm, I think I'm pretty clear on, on your position on the recommendation that's come forward uh, from their office uh, about narrowing the exemption for in-house personnel of nonprofit organizations. In in the stated issue is that the current exemption in the Act for in-house personnel of nonprofit organizations is overly broad, which creates a serious gap in public transparency and accountability about in-house lobbying and unwarranted inequality among nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. So if you could maybe speak to, if you see that there's a, a I think your, your overall stand is that, that there is no issue, um, but I, with regards to unwarranted inequality among nonprofit organizations, uh, do, do, do you see that as an issue? Uh, and also with regards to uh, the current exemption, um, is there any room for uh, revisiting that, uh, that aspect of, of that exemption? Thank you, through the Chair. Thank you for your question. And um, thank you for uh, your support and the work that we do every day. It's, uh, it's deeply appreciated. Um, look, you know, there is no perfect system here. So the choice that is presented is whether the public benefit gained by open communication between government and nonprofits is a worthwhile trade off for a heightened level of public transparency around when meetings with government are taking place which would almost certainly lead to less interaction between government and nonprofits. And if I could, um, one of the issues in the recommendation from Commissioner Tressler is related to inequity or creating equality. And I just wanna point out a couple of examples of why I think that perhaps in this recommendation, we're not really getting to a place of equity. So 
For example, you could have under the recommendation from Commissioner Tressler, um, a religious organization, which would not be exempt according to the recommendation that provides shelter services and is a nonprofit. And you could have another exact same nonprofit that um, has a mandate to relieve poverty, not a religious organization that provides shelter services that would be exempt. So two organizations providing a very similar service. One being a religious organization would make it non-exempt and the other providing the tangible benefit of relief of poverty would make it exempt. And there's other kinds of examples. Let me give you an alternate example. You could have a large um, organization that provides childcare, but whose main mandate is community recreation. So they would be exempt, but they might be very actively lobbying for affordable childcare. And they may actually be lobbying against private interest on that issue, but they would be exempt. So they would not be registered under the recommendation from Commissioner Tressler. So no perfect system. I would argue, and we're taking the stance now, that the most equitable system is to say, if your lobbying activity has as an end result, the possibility for private gain, then you should have to register and provide that transparency. If you have no possibility for private gain, you're in the public benefit, then you're working with government. You do not need to register. And I will also say, that nonprofits provide a, a very high level of transparency. Most will provide their policy agenda online. Indeed, when, when we, which could be considered, I suppose, a think tank, although that's undefined, um, it pro provide things like feedback to this committee or any correspondence to government, we make that publicly available. So there's no uh, lack of transparency in the interaction between government and the public benefit or nonprofit sector. And in fact, these recommendations could create further inequities that are very difficult to understand. And so we think that um, the solution that you have reduces red tape, it is elegant and it works. So um, we do not see the need to fix it at this time. Thank you very much for that, no supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Van Dyken. Any further questions? At this time, Mr. Walker. Sure. Thanks so much for your presentation and for all the work you do. Uh, I've always been of the opinion um, that community organizations, especially, are the lifeblood of civil society. So, uh, and I've really enjoyed the back and forth here in the dialogue. Um, now, from your submission to the committee, it is clear that your organizations do not want to see any changes to the current exemption because you note how significant the services offered by your member organizations are. And I, I've clearly heard that in your presentation. I am certainly very grateful uh, for the presence of the public benefit nonprofit uh, in our communities. And I am wondering if you could share some of the metrics that you might use to measure the value your member organizations uh, provide to the community. I'd be very curious on that, so uh, please go ahead. We're, we're both waiting for one another, I think, to answer this question through the chair. Thank you very much for that um, question. I mean, I think, you know, there's, um, uh, if you've seen, you know, the depth and breadth of what is encompassed in the nonprofit sector, you can understand um, how it might be difficult for us to give you generally what kind of metrics would be um, used as measurement. But I can say in a general sense that every nonprofit would operate under a mandate. And that mandate would very clearly identify 
um, what the impact the nonprofit is intending to do with their work and their services to the public. And so that can be measured depending on what the intent of the nonprofit is specifically, but the types of measurements might be, um, you know, uh, if it's to relieve poverty, for instance, then it might be an indicator of how many Albertans are above or below the poverty line in terms of their work and their effort. It could be very specific. It could be number of students or youth involved in an activity or a program that is after school care related. Um, it could be an arts and culture metric of bums and seats. So it's a kind of a massive group of metrics. When we think at the 30,000 foot level about what it is we're trying to um, do with our work, we think about it in the terms of community prosperity. So we think about how prosperous are our communities, how prosperous are Albertans able to be within their communities. I would only add um, to Karen's um, very elegant um, explanation um, that there is no single measurement. Um, Organisations have a variety of different outcomes that they're reporting on based on their, their mandates, as, as Karen explained. However, I would, I would argue that um, non-profit organisations and charities in Alberta touch every single Albertan. Uh, in, a, in a given year, whether it's through sport, art, heritage, childcare, the relief of poverty. So when we talk about civil society, we're talking about all of those things. And so I would argue that not one Albertan is not touched by a charity or a nonprofit at some point during a single calendar year. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you heard, uh, that is the end of the 15-minute time block, but that's not uh, absolute. But I don't have any other questions or hands raised that I can see at this time. And seeing none, I would like to thank Ms. Ball, Ms. Briggs, and Ms. Dunn for your time today and your obvious passion and care for not just uh, this topic, but our community all across Alberta. Thank you for the work that you do and your time with us today. You're welcome to stay online. Uh, but we will now be moving to the next presenter. Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome Dr. Bob Wyatt, Executive Director for the Modart Foundation, and Mr. Jeff Braun, Director of Policy, to make their presentation. Dr. Wyatt, you have 15 minutes for your presentation, and as you've been online, you will see that there will be approximately 15 minutes for questions following that. We will start your time now. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thanks so much for the invitation to be with you today as you consider your recommendations to the Assembly. I'd like to begin with an anecdote that's told by Ken Bosenkohl. Some of you will know of him and more of you will know of him. He's held a variety of political staffer positions, operated his own government relations firm, and is currently teaching. Mr. Bosenkohl tells of acting on behalf of a client government was considering certain changes that would affect that client and others in the same industry. Mr. Bosenkohl kept the theme for his client very simple. The client was told to deliver this message over and over again. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It ain't broke, don't fix it. If you fix it, you will break it. If you break it, you will need to fix it. I'm here today to tell you that the Lobbyist Act, at least as it relates to charities and public benefit nonprofits, ain't broke. And if you try to fix it, as successive commissioners have unsuccessfully recommended at every review, you're going to break something important. You will cause harm, and I don't think any of you want to do that. Let me pause for a moment to introduce the Matart Foundation. I have the distinct honor of representing one of Western Canada's oldest private foundations. Founded in 1953, we exist to support charities. We do this through grants, through technical support, through research, and through advocacy on behalf of charities of all types, whether we fund them or not. We do no fundraising. Our grants and our operating costs come from income we earn on the endowment that Gladys and Merrill Matart left to the foundation after their successful business careers. 
for much of the last quarter century, we've paid particular attention to the regulation of charities. As one of our directors is fond of saying, it should not be hard to do good. We advocate on behalf of reasonable regulation, reasonably applied. We work with governments at all levels to help identify issues and their solutions. We believe that people of goodwill, when fully informed, can develop solutions that allow charities to do what they're meant to do, provide benefit to Canadians and to those we serve outside of the country. It is in this spirit that we come to you today to talk about the Lobbyist Act. When the Act was first introduced, it was drafted very broadly. Throughout the province, charities and nonprofits met with individual MLAs and explained the administrative burden they would face if they were covered by the Act. They explained how their organizations interact with government all the time on any number of issues. Sometimes the issue related only to their organization, but as often as not, they were meeting with elected members and officials to discuss systemic changes that would make life better for Albertans. When the matter came before the government caucus of the day, members asked all sorts of questions as a result of the meetings they'd had with nonprofits in their constituencies. And then something extraordinary happened. The then Premier said it was never his intention that the Act should include charities. And so the amendment, the current Section 3.1i, was introduced. It exempted all charities and, exempt, and it exempted other nonprofits that exist for a public benefit and not for the benefit of private interests. Before I go on, let me clarify some terminology because I find it something that often gets in the way. All charities are nonprofits, but not all nonprofits are charities. Nonprofits are, as the name suggests, established for any purpose other than profit. Within that limitation, there can and do exist all types of organizations, from a book club to a service club to the Canadian Medical Association and the Alberta Motor Association. But one subset of this group, charities, must by law exist for a public benefit as established by law. And so charities fall automatically within the exemption contained in Section 3.1i of the Act because they cannot by law provide any undue private benefit. They are subject to significant regulation by the Canada Revenue Agency and are required to file annual returns. The only entities in Canada whose full tax returns are posted online. When the exemption was being drafted, the question arose about what to do about certain other groups, some community leagues, sports teams, and so on, that exist for a public benefit but are not charities. And so the government of the day adopted the exemption using language from the Quebec legislation. It was considered at the time to be an elegant solution. It recognized that the act was meant to capture those people and organizations that were seeking some sort of private benefit from government. The amendment recognized that when governments are dealing with charities and vice versa, there is a different dynamic. The nonprofit is not trying to get some personal gain, but rather is working with government in the public interest and for a public benefit. The nonprofits, therefore, are akin to some of the other entities that are exempted under, sub, under Section 3.1. The message that I want to leave with you today is that the system works, and it's worked ever since the legislation was enacted. The two reviews that have taken place found that the current system works, and there was no reason to make any changes. Our position is that there is still no reason. In other words, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Although there are some suggestions of the Commissioner's submission that I want to address, my main point is that none of the arguments that are made are new. They were made in 2012, and they were made in 2016-17. And your predecessors saw no reason to recommend any change. We believe you should come to the same conclusion. 
It's our view that no good reason has been shown to remove the exemption. <clears throat> no good reason exists to divert time and attention from the important work charities and nonprofits are doing in your constituencies and elsewhere. It's not a good enough reason to say they should register and report so they can say they're working for the betterment of the community. You already know that. You tell them that when you show up at their fundraisers. You reinforce it when you send gifts for them to sell at their silent auctions. And like me, you probably have spent more money than you should have on buying some of the things on those, at those silent auctions. You sing their praises in the letters to them that they attach to their bids for grants or the notes you send when one of the volunteers is recognized for outstanding service. You also know that almost all of them are working with way fewer staff than they would like to have. You know they all want to do more and better and make more lives better, whether that's through the arts, social services, or sports and recreation. You know the challenges they've faced over the last two years. You know that some of them are in incredibly precarious positions. And I suspect you know how much poorer your community would be if they didn't exist. Back in 2007, we encouraged these organizations to meet individually with their MLAs to explain what would happen if the exemption were not granted. If that would be helpful, we can encourage them to do that again. You'll certainly have a much greater appreciation, I suggest, of the strain under which most charities are now working. And yet they are working. Indeed, it would have been a very sad state if charities and nonprofits hadn't been there to serve their communities over the last two years. It's ironic, I suggest, that we're talking about changing the law to require charities to register under the Lobbyist Act. At the same time, government is consulting about removing the burden of registering under the Charitable Fundraising Act. Some would say and have said, it's even more ironic that we're having this conversation during Red Tape Reduction Awareness Week. How much more good, I wonder, could be accomplished if instead we spent our time thinking about how charities and government can work together even more closely? Many government programs are delivered by charities and nonprofits. Other programs are delivered to the same people that are served by charities and nonprofits. Just think for a moment how wonderful it would be if government and these organizations co-created policies and programs, combining government priorities and data with a broad experience of those closest to the ground. I do want to comment on one aspect of the commissioner's submission, one I believe is very dangerous. At page 18 of the commissioner's brief, she suggests a new definition of what organization should benefit from the exemption in section 3.1i. It's bad enough in my view that we already have so many differing definition of what constitutes a charity or a charitable purpose for provincial purposes. Creating another one is unnecessary, unwise, and entirely inconsistent with the stated desire to reduce red tape. But even more than that, Adoption of the commissioner's recommendation would create a situation in which some charities and nonprofits are considered more worthy than others. That may be a decision that is appropriate when talking about the awarding of grants. It is not appropriate when talking about who should be regulated. First, I would note that adoption of the recommendation would likely remove the exemption for all places of worship. Few of them spend at least 75% of their annual budget on the types of services of which the commissioner seems to approve. Second and more distressing, the commissioner specifically would remove the exemption for research and policy institutions, but without any explanation of why or how that would apply to such institutes at universities. And without even mentioning them, the commissioner's recommendation would remove the exemption for environmental organizations. I would remind the committee that the Allen inquiry found that the charities and nonprofits it examined broke no laws, federal or provincial. This is not a place to punish them for something they've been found not to have done. 
But turning from the practical to the philosophical, I want to raise the question of whether we're going to impose or remove regulatory burden depending on the extent to which the government of the day agrees with positions taken by individual organizations. As we suggested in our submission to the Allen Inquiry, that comes dangerously close to regulating expression. Imposing a regulatory burden by failing to specifically mention one kind of charity seems with respect to be a road we should not be going down in a free and democratic society. The courts up to and including the Supreme Court of Canada have clearly set out what is charitable in law. The charitable sector should not be divided with some cherry picked for extra regulation based on what those charities do. That recommendation should, we suggest, be clearly and quickly refused. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I return to where I started. The existing system works and has worked for 15 years. There is no need to fix it, at least as it relates to the exemption for public benefit nonprofits. We urge the committee to let charities do what they do best, serve our communities and those around the world without an unnecessary and imprudent regulatory change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Wyatt. Uh, I neglected to let members of the committee know that after the question portion of this uh, segment is concluded, we will have a short break, um, just in case anybody was wondering when that was going to happen. I apologize for that. Uh, now I will open the floor for questions. I have one on the list. Uh, Ms. Fry, you have your question. Hi, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm, as you were speaking, I was struck by your comment, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think that's more of the, that's something that legislators should learn to live by, I think. Um, I was I was struck by your comments around nonprofits and the, and the uh, harmful impact it could have on them. And I know that there's probably many MLAs in the room who are thinking of um, organizations in their own community and just how much, um, how, how difficult we could make it for them by making too many changes. But the, elect, the ethics commissioner's um, expressed purpose for putting forward that recommendation was about public trust. So I guess my question is for you, um, how do you see, um, do you see that there's an issue with public trust in the not-for-profit sector? And, and do you think that this, um, that this change would accomplish that or do you think that it would make it worse? Well, as, as my colleagues from the, the Chambers of Voluntary Organizations uh, suggested, um, we certainly haven't seen any evidence of overwhelming public uh, demand for, uh, for transparency because people can uh, go to the CRA website and, and see the returns of any charity. Um, they can um, look to their websites, uh, as Commissioner Allen, in fact, did. Uh, during his inquiry to find out what what charities have been doing. Um, as some of you will know, Matart ran a, um, a, a research study uh, for about 50 years uh, called uh, Talking About Charities, where we uh, did interviews across the country to look at public trust in charities. And the um, public trust in charities was always ranking around 80% or more. Uh, I won't tell you where, where politicians fell on that, that list. I'm sure you hear that often enough as it is. Um, I would suggest to you that through those statements, through that research, and through the donations that Canadians make to charities, public trust in charities is not an issue and it will not be enhanced by uh, the sort of changes that the commissioner has requested. Uh, I'd invite Mr. Braun to add any comments he wants to that. Well, I, I, I think you've, you've, you've covered it, Mr. Wyatt. Um, I, I suppose the only thing I would add is that, you know, as, as Ms. Dunn said, you know, in the absence of a, of a problem uh, to which lifting uh, the exemption would be would be a solution. I think it's important to consider, uh, 
you know, the, the, the timing of this conversation, of this discussion, uh, nonprofits and charities have arguably played a, a critical role in, in supporting uh, our communities through the pandemic. They will continue uh, to uh, fulfill a, a, a critical uh, role going forward um, into pandemic recovery. I simply cannot think of a worse time uh, to um, increase the administrative uh, burden on, on Alberta's public benefit nonprofits. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I, Mr. Chairman, if I could just make one more comment. Okay. Let's bear in mind that the definition of, um, of lobbying uh, encompasses basically any communication that relates to everything from legislation down to a directive and is addressed to anyone from a cabinet minister down to any employee of a department. So when you're in your constituency um, trying to go about your business grocery shopping and someone from um, a nonprofit in your organization, in, in your constituency comes up to you and says, can we talk at some point about how we might address the issue of X in our community? That's lobbying. Is there really a need to capture that? To what end? They are looking at find, trying to find, to work with you to benefit the community, not to put money in anyone's pockets, not to get money for shareholders. Those are important things for sure, and they're covered under the Act. But if one looks at who else is exempted under Section 3, Subsection 1 of the Act, I'd suggest that the public benefit nonprofits are closer to them than they are to the for-profits that are covered by the Act. Uh, Ms. Fry, do you have a supplemental? I don't, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the response. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Billis. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, folks, for, uh, for presenting uh, your perspective and, and recognizing how many uh, not-for-profits that, uh, that you all represent and, and work with and deal with. So I have a, a quick comment or a brief comment and then a question. Um, I do think it's important uh, that, uh, that you folks raised the fact that any changes for the not-for-profits would be an additional administrative burden. And we hear, and I'm sure every MLA in this room uh, and on the line hears all the time of the challenges that not-for-profits have in securing funding and that most have a dedicated grant writer. Uh, I could see changes to this forcing upon not-for-profits to now have a lobbyist compliance officer uh, trying to log and track uh, what, uh, what are valuable conversations with uh, decision makers. I mean, I think everybody in this room recognizes the value and role that not-for-profits play in our society. And for me, you know, you're your point about the smaller, especially not-for-profits, having a chilling effect on them being scared to engage in conversations, does that fall within lobbying or not? Sounds like confusion. Um, and quite frankly, it does sound like a boatload of red tape. Um, and so uh, appreciate your comments um, on that. So my question really is, so you, you folks have discussed removing the exemption uh, as a addressing a problem that doesn't exist. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can expand a little bit on this. And in your work, have, have your members or anyone come forward with concerns of the exemption or anything related to the Lobbyist Act? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Billis, um, first of all, if, if I can, just dealing with the preamble, it would be uh, only the largest organizations in the province that have dedicated grant writers. Uh, that I mean, the the reality is that most nonprofits, certainly most charities, uh, for whom we've got detailed information in Alberta, are very small. Uh, significant number that are run solely by volunteers. Many more that have one or two staff. The larger nonprofits are the ex exception rather than the rule. Um, the just to add to the confusion of trying to figure out what was lobbying and what wasn't. Bear in mind that all of those charities and nonprofits have volunteer boards of directors. And what the, the discussions that those volunteers have 
with the provincial government do not constitute lobbying. So not only do you have to decide whether a particular communication is lobbying or not within the definition of lobbying, but then you have to figure out who had the conversation and whether it's now exempted because it was a volunteer that had it and wasn't someone who was paid. Um, I think that the only thing, frankly, that I hear from um, about the Lobbyist Act between the statutory reviews is some uh, nonprofits which are currently not exempted under the Act saying they too would like to be exempted. And you've again had some submissions at this review that organizations like Chambers of Commerce should be exempted. The, the, when the Act was passed in 2007, there was a very clear rationale for the, where the line was drawn. I suggest that was, was drawn in a good place and a place that can be justified logically, um, economically, and in a spirit of legislative restraint. I don't see that there has been any demand, public or otherwise, for a change in, in the exemption. We only hear about it. I mean, the only time anyone talks about the Lobbyist Act is at the statutory review, right? Those who are required to register and file, register and file, those who are exempted, don't worry about it until every five years, a committee is established to look at it again. Uh, Mr. Billis, do you have a supplemental? No? Any other question? Mr. Roswell. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I, um, you know, the short time I've been in MLA, I've seen organizations that provide really good uh, public benefit, and they're nonprofits, and they're financed by not government. And, uh, and I, I take it that's what your organization, like you don't get anything from government, is what I thought I heard. We do not. Okay. Um, what, what's happened to a few in my constituency is that is the flow of money from their sources dried up, and they said, look at the good service that we're providing. We need money from the government. And then they become, we become part of their annual requirement of cash flow in order to operate their business. And somehow we have to measure uh, the public benefit and, and that type of thing. Is there, what, what metrics do you use in your organization to see what your public benefit was or the impact that you had? Um, well, in, in our, sorry, in, in our case, um, our support is generally in the form of grants to organizations. So we're another funder, um, much like government is. In each of the government grant programs or contracts, um, and over the, the past two decades, we've moved from um, looking at an organization and saying, are they doing good work or not? And we, I, I mean, generally, funders governmental and non-governmental to a more competitive grant-making um, environment where an RFP is put out and everybody uh, submits and the decision makers, whether within the foundation or within government, decide amongst that pile of applications which ones to support. So we see that all the time in uh, community facilities enhancement program um, and, and grant programs through children's services and every ministry that deals with the sector. We can have, and, and I would welcome a discussion at some point about the problems we may have created by moving to a competitive grant making system. But um, the reality is that while donations are not increasing as much as the sector would like, individual donations, receipted donations to Canadian charities continues to grow year over year, but the need also continues to grow. Uh, and I think that's what government is seeing and we, uh, we as non-governmental funders are seeing. There are constantly more demands and those, those demands are more complex. <clears throat> Whereas one um, might one at one time have said, we need to fund this recreation program because outdoor play is a good thing. We now have an issue where we need to look at that question of outdoor play involving as well issues around people who are differently abled, 
around issues on you uh, liability um around issues of um of of those suffering from mental illnesses and how we make how we incorporate that so the we're starting to recognize society is becoming more complex and i need not tell any member of the assembly that and so our funding has to become more sophisticated to deal with those increasing complexities but the metrics are what do the people in your constituency need in order to have the best life possible and are they getting it and whether that's from government or the sector and more and more government is delivering its programs through voluntary organizations um how do we make that even better and that's why i, I talk about the co-creation if, if government says we need to do something around this and we can bring the nonprofits to the table and say well the people we're dealing with respond best to this sort of thing Think of how much time and energy we could save in developing a program that's going to work better on the ground. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Oh, Mr. Nielsen, I see your name on the list. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And looking at the time, I know we're wrapping up here. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. White, for your presentation, and frankly, for all our presenters uh, today. Uh, it's it's been interesting listening to the discussion of red tape i think i've heard more today in this meeting than i have uh, probably over the last six months uh very excited about that um to avoid you know whether any proposed red tape reduction is right or wrong let me just simply ask because uh, i'm getting a sense here are we looking at possible unintended consequences uh to the sector um that that would be faced uh, by you guys. Mr. Chair, Mr. Nielsen, um, yes, you're going to take time away from staff who should be working on other things. Short answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Nielsen, do you have a supplemental? Yes. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Wyatt and Mr. Braun. We appreciate your time. Uh, we will now, as a committee, be taking a 10 minute break. So at uh, 10 to we will be reconvening uh, sorry for the inconvenience of those of you who are online uh, but feel free to uh, take that break if you're in the room thank you very much
up to this point. Dr. Amato? Good morning. I hope that you can both hear me. We can. Thank you. Um, and I also hope you have a copy of um, the rather lengthy cross-jurisdictional scan. Um, as, uh, as was just stated, um, the request that came to the committee was to provide uh, an overview of lobbyist legislation in jurisdictions across Canada, um, in the United States, and in the United Kingdom. And um, therefore, I um, hope you'll indulge me in issuing an apology to the committee that um, somehow we or I missed the request for um, to include information on the United Kingdom. So um, I have completed that research and I will issue um, a revised document as soon as I can, either today or, or tomorrow. And, and I sincerely apologize to the committee for that oversight. Um, if you will permit me, I'll just provide um, a brief overview of the document that you have, and I will say one or two things about, about the United Kingdom, um, should there be any questions about that. So uh, with respect to the document that you have, um, it provides, and I'll start with the Canadian content, so that's, that's, um, that's the, the, the main substantive section of the document. So it provides um, an overview of lobbyist legislation in 12 jurisdictions across Canada, those that contain um, lobbyist acts. And it's divided into a discussion of um, seven issues, each of which is uh, briefly summarized in the executive summary, which you might want to turn to on page one. Um, I'll briefly go through each each of these seven topics. So the first um, topic is definitions of lobbying. And the legislation in each jurisdiction defines matters about which a person can lobby and also defines what is not considered to be lobbying in each jurisdiction. The second major topic is uh, the requirement to register. So I know, as you've heard a lot about, um, each uh, piece each statute dis distinguishes between um, what are called consultant lobbyists and in-house or organization lobbyists. And with respect to in-house or organization lobbyists, an organization is only required to register uh, in lobbying activities if its employees meet a certain threshold. And the threshold differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction across Canada. Each jurisdiction in Canada also um, sets out certain filing 
uh, requirements that both consultant lobbyists and in-house or organization lobbyists um, must meet. So they first, uh, they must be registered in the lobbyist registry, which is available online and searchable free of charge. British Columbia's Act is of particular note among the provinces because it has been recently amended and, in, and includes the requirement for lobbyists to file monthly returns. Um, the federal act uh, also requires monthly returns, but British Columbia's uh, legislation is different amongst provinces, as I said, with, the, with respect to this requirement. Uh, the third topic is fees. And um, there are fees associated with the filing of, of returns, and they vary from nothing to $174. In general, across all provinces, there are no fees required at all for filing online, um, but there are some fees associated in some provinces with filing manual returns. The next topic is code of conduct, and only three jurisdictions across Canada um, have a lobbyist code of conduct. These are Quebec, Newfoundland, and Labrador, and the federal jurisdiction. Um, it may also be noted that both uh, British Columbia and Ontario statutes provide the registrar with the authority to issue a code of conduct, but none currently exists. Um, the next topic is restrictions on lobbying, and five restrictions on lobbying are considered in the comparison, and none of these are common to all statutes. Um, these are, uh, for example, prohibitions on lobbying if a lobbyist provides paid advice to government, or um, restrictions on lobbying by former public office holders, um, amongst um, the other three. The, um, the document then turns to offenses and penalties, and the offenses common to all 12 jurisdictions are failing to file returns and providing false or misleading information to the registrar commissioner. With respect to information provided on the United States, you'll find that in Appendix A, and there I've attempted to provide um, a general overview of, of lobbyist legislation. I've noted for you um, that um, the differences between the, the American and the Canadian regulatory regimes make direct comparisons quite, quite difficult. And I've also noted that there are not a lot of commonalities within the United States, uh, within, uh, uh, between, between states. So what I've attempted to do is to provide information on four topics. And these topics are uh, definitions of lobbying and lobbyists, um, lobbyist reporting requirements, lobbyist registration, and use of public funds to lobbying to lobby. And um, information is provided for the jurisdictions of Arizona, California, New York, North Dakota, and Texas. And most of this information, in fact, all of it, is taken from the National Council of State Legislatures legislatures, which provides information on all 50 states. So if the committee is interested on, on, um, on information relating to particular American jurisdictions, I would invite you to um, follow the website links that are provided in my comparison, and you'll find um, very, very useful charts on, on those states um, on that website. Finally, um, Appendix B uh, is forthcoming. Again, I apologize that it's not included in the, in the original document, and it deals with lobbyist legislation in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom uh, enacted lobbyist legislation in 2014, and that legislation regulates um, consultant lobbyists, establishes a register for consultant lobbyists, and establishes a consultant lobbyist registrar. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Amato. No need to apologize. I think you've done a tremendous amount of work, as always, and incredibly thorough, uh, far beyond what I've expected, and I deeply appreciate the work that you put in. So thank you for that. Uh, we do look forward to any the additional information on the United Kingdom. At this time, I will start a list for questions. Are there any... 
questions? Sorry, Mr. Nielsen, did you put up your hand? Yes. Yep, please go ahead. Great, I'll lead us off, awesome. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Amato, for uh, uh, the submission and uh, unfortunately being a substitute on the committee, I haven't had a chance to completely go through the document <laughs> uh, just yet. Um, I guess I'm just wondering in terms of um, legislation that's uh, reviewed in other jurisdictions uh, like ours, uh, obviously we do it uh, every five years here in Alberta. Um, is, is that the case in other jurisdictions? What kind of differences are there? Um, you ask the one question I do not know the answer to. Um, I will take a quick look, and I did not write it. We did not write about it, either of us. Um, if you'd like, I'm very happy. I'm going to be updating the document anyway. I will get back to you with that information. Fantastic. Nelson seems to have a knack for those kinds of questions. <laughs> Do you have a supplemental? Maybe with a follow up, I can go two for two here. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I, I'll just assume that you had the opportunity to listen in on the, uh, the presentations. Uh, particularly, I want to draw your attention around uh, the volunteer organizations that presented today. Um, and of course, the issue around uh, the exemption, uh, that seemed to be a, a bit of a hot topic uh, for them. I was wondering if you might be able to, uh, to speak to uh, you know, what exemptions might have been provided in other jurisdictions, um, and are, are there any similarities, I guess, to what uh, may be getting proposed uh, for here in Alberta? Um. I think by way of an answer, I would draw your attention to the discussion of um, in the document on, who, I guess, who was not a lobbyist, and then also um, both the um, the threshold for the thresholds which differ across the country for for um, for organization or in or in house lobbyists and who must lobby there. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I also don't have a direct answer for this. Um, I would simply, you know, draw your attention to those two, um, sections of the document. Excellent we'll questions, Mr. Nielsen. As always, excellent questions. Any other questions? Online, I want to make sure, that please feel free to raise your hand or signal the clerk in any way if you do have a question. Final call for questions in the room. Seeing none, Dr. Matto, I'd like to thank you again for your incredible work. I have found uh, it, as always, to be incredibly thrilled, uh, even if with the understanding that Mr. Nielsen seems to find the one or two things that hasn't been written about. Uh, I do appreciate your work, and thank you for your time and efforts today. Uh, I'm sure that if the committee requires further clarifications, we will... Uh, find uh, time to, to have you come back to the committee and, and provide further information. With that, <clears throat> I will uh, open to go to the, the uh, agendas, other business. Is there any other business that members wish to discuss? Online. Seeing and hearing none. What I would like to now propose is that we go in camera uh, this requires unanimous consent. I would like to have a short discussion, which I will limit to 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so being that it is unanimous consent, rather than taking a motion, I will ask one question, one question, and only is if, the, or do I need a motion? Okay, so what I'll, I'll back that up. If someone would be willing to uh, put forward a motion that we go into camera, we can second that, move that, and then I would have to take the vote in terms of unanimous consent. Mr. Roswell has provided the motion that we go to in camera. All those, no, sorry, the seconder is Mr. Walker. Now I will ask the one question, or do I have to take a vote? We don't need a second. Okay. So, so what I will do then is just take a, 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 ask the question for unanimous consent, if there's anyone in the room opposed to going in camera, please say so now. Thank you. Anyone online, anyone opposed to going in camera, please say so now. <clears throat> Hearing none, we will briefly go in camera. I would ask all those not part of the elected committee, both online and um, in the room, to please exit the room as we have this discussion.
of the next meeting the committee will meet on March the 2nd 2022 at 9 a.m. to hear additional oral presentations uh, again much of that content is on the online committee portal if there's nothing else for the committee's consideration I would like to call a motion to adjourn and just before we have that motion there is lunch provided for members of the committee in the room back here if you'd like to avail of those services please feel free to do so uh, Mr. Barnes with a motion to adjourn moved that the February 23rd 2022 meeting of the Standing Committee on Alberta's Economic Future be adjourned those in the room all in flavor please say aye, aye. any opposed please say no online all those in favor please say aye, aye. anyone online opposed please say no <laughs> that motion is carried this meeting is adjourned thank you all appreciate your time and efforts today